Okay, ready to get started. Um, I'm Alan Dabney. I'm an associate professor here in the Department of Statistics. Uh, I have a PhD in biostatistics from the University of Washington. And we will be doing applied multivariate statistical analysis together. Let's see, my office is in this, on this floor, just right across the hallway over there in suite 459. Uh, office hours, um, just let me know whenever you have questions. You're free to come by my office whenever you want. Um, I don't guarantee that I'll have time every, every time you come by, but you're welcome to come by. If you come by and my um, door is closed, feel free to knock. I keep my door closed sometimes to keep it quiet, but you're welcome to knock. The, the class is all about uh, multivariate data. So what is multivariate data? We'll talk about it a little bit in a moment. But the, the big picture is we have for each of um, a collection of individuals in our sample, a collection of people from a population or devices from an assembly line or, or whatever, for each of the individuals we have multiple variables that we're recording. Instead of just uh, the price of this one stock uh, in a particular time period, we might be interested in the price of four stocks at, over a particular time period. So instead of looking at one feature or variable at a time, we're going to consider multiple variables jointly. There are benefits to doing that. Why should we do it that way? I'll talk about that. Doing multivariate analysis often gives you more information, a richer picture of relationships than looking at variables individually. Because of joint relationships that often exist between different variables, by considering them jointly, we can see a, a more intricate picture of reality, I guess. There will be some math background. In particular, we need to be reminded of uh, basic matrix and vector uh, operations because multivariate statistics is largely driven by matrix operations. Um, matrices because we have multivariate data. So we need to estimate values for parameters, and we also need to estimate standard deviations for our estimates. But because we have multiple variables, there's now also covariances and co correlations between the variables. So we have two-dimensional things when it comes to characterizing our data, matrices. We'll do a little bit of review on uh, the, the key vector and matrix operations that we'll need. We'll introduce the idea of a random vector. This is the multivariate analog of what you see in your, in your intro stat classes uh, of a univariate random vector. A univariate, or I'm sorry, a univariate random variable would be a, a variable whose outcome is random and is a single number. Now we're going to talk about a vector of numbers, each of which are randomly observed. Once we've defined random vectors, then we need to define probability distributions for vectors. So those are multivariate distributions. The distribution of um, stock price, for example, for one stock would be a, a one-dimensional distribution, maybe the normal distribution or gamma or some distribution that you've heard of. In the multivariate context, we have to say the distribution of this variable and that one and that one and that one is such and such. So we need to meet um, some multivariate distributions that we can use. Classical multivariate statistics relies heavily on a multivariate normal distribution. So you know, like in a, if you were to do a t-test, if you wanted to test whether one mean is different from another mean, we have this uh, classical technique of the t-test and the t-test has assumptions. Uh, in particular, we assume that the, the population distribution is normal before we do a t-test. 
many statistical techniques have assumptions of one kind or another. Uh, a lot of the classical multivariate techniques have a multivariate normal assumption. That said, I'll show you some techniques that allow you to be more flexible than, uh, than otherwise you'd have to be. Okay, uh, And we'll focus on both exploratory techniques for multivariate data and inferential techniques. Exploratory techniques would include things like principal component analysis, cluster analysis, um, other visual visualization techniques where you have high dimensional data which you can't see very well with your naked eye, but multivariate techniques um, allow us to make pictures that we can visualize um, in such a way that, that we didn't lose too much information by going from high dimensional down to a low dimensional image. So exploratory stuff as well as formal inferential stuff. So inference would be uh, computing a confidence interval or computing a p-value when doing a, a hypothesis test. It also includes the task of uh, prediction or the related task of classification. So we will talk about um, classification in particular. Classification is when you want to predict the value of a categorical variable based on some input variables. For example, does a person have cancer or not on the basis of 500 uh, gene expression measurements? Or is this device going to fail this year, yes or no, based on five input variables about how long it's gone without calibration, you know, what temperatures has it been run in, and stuff like that. So inference is trying to make statements about the population with a stated level of confidence. That includes confidence intervals, hypothesis tests, and prediction slash classification. The machine learning jargon, uh, which could just as well be called statistical learning, data mining, uh, there's a lot of overlap between the terms, but often what is meant by um, learning, in particular supervised learning, is prediction or classification. So we will t spend a fair amount of time talking about um, statistical learning, machine learning, data mining type things, but within the under the umbrella of prediction slash classification. That's all we're doing. Uh, let's see, we will see factor analysis, we will see canonical correlation analysis. So you'll have several things in your toolbox that you can apply to multivariate data. As far as prerequisites go, I'm assuming you know what, I'm, I'm assuming you know basic statistics and basic statistical inference, in particular probabilities, probability functions, and what a confidence interval is, how to interpret one. What a hypothesis test is, how to interpret one. Uh, I hope you know what simple linear regression is. If you don't know those things, I recommend that you get a basic introductory statistics book and read up on them. Confidence intervals, hypothesis tests, probability distributions um, are things that we're going to jump right into here. The other thing that uh, is a prerequisite is some familiarity with linear algebra because we will be doing like eigenvectors and eigenvalues and inverses of matrices and things like that. So in the textbook, which is methods of multivariate analysis, uh, the first couple of chapters do that. Go through um, the, the elements of linear algebra that you need. So Hopefully you've had some linear algebra. If you have not, I recommend that you immediately go read up on it. The first couple of chapters of the textbook are sufficient. If you know that stuff, you're OK. You don't have to go take a, a linear algebra class. OK, there's about um, 40 or 45 students who are following along at a distance online. Um, so all the, the lectures are going to be recorded. That means my voice is recorded and the screen is recorded, which includes anything I write on the screen. Usually the same day of the lecture, that'll be the lecture video will be posted to eCampus. 
under lecture videos. So if you can't make a class or if there was something that we talked about that, that didn't click for you, go watch the lecture video, pause, rewind, and all of that. On Tuesday nights at uh, 6 o'clock, there will be question and answer session. So what this is is, is predominantly for the um, online students as an opportunity to, for them to essentially have an office hour, a live office hour with me. So in Blocker 411, which is on the other side of this floor, um, it'll be just like this. I'm mic'd up and we're recording, but there will be folks logged in live who can talk live with me. That said, you are welcome to come. Anybody is welcome to come. In particular, if you're needing more office hours, more personal assistance, one-on-one, -on -one, come to the Q&As. All right. <clears throat> yes? Yes, the Q&A sessions are also recorded. And if you have questions but you can't come to the Q&A, I recommend that you post it on the discussion board. Like like on Tuesdays, post something to the discussion board. Could you please talk about this in the Q&A? And I can do that. So I do expect you to get this book. Um, you will need to get this software called R. So let's see. R is an open source free bit of software. Uh, if you've never used it before, you'll get plenty of practice. I'll give you lots of examples of um, R code that does all the tasks that I'll ask you to do. So whenever, whenever I ask you to do principal component analysis of a data set, you will have at least one example where you can go where I did it. If you have no programming experience whatsoever, then you will be challenged. Um, that said, I don't intend this to be an R class. I'm not here to teach you R, but we need a full-featured bit of software to, to really do um, all of multivariate statistics. So please get R today. Google R, uh, or just go to this site. You can download it. Um, something I forgot to put in the syllabus is there's a book that I recommend if you are new to R, um, called the R Cookbook, and I'll post something on eCampus, a detail about this. Um, but there's a book called the R Cookbook. It, let's see, I think you can download a PDF for free online. I know you can access the PDF for free through the library.tamu site. You go to library.tamu.edu, log in, search for R Cookbook, you can view the book. And I would recommend if you're new to R, certainly if you're new to programming, you go look at that book now and read the first couple of chapters. Read the first couple of chapters and work along with it because it has, here's an example of how you do this. So type it in yourself and see what it does. Here's an example of how you do that. Type it in yourself. Maybe change one or two things to make sure you know what's, what the different components are doing. Okay, we will have homework. Uh, I'm going to aim for one homework assignment every two weeks. Um, all local students, please email your uh, homework submission directly to Juan, our TA, at his email address. And it would make his job easiest if you saved your homework submissions as last name underscore first name dot pd. I'll post our first homework assignment um, probably tomorrow, and it'll be due probably the end of next week. Homework's 30%. Exams, we have two of them. Each of them are 35%. For the exams, you will need a laptop with R installed. I guess if we're in this room, you can just show up because we have laptops. But you will, on the exams, be expected to download a data set and actually do some stuff in R. So your exam submissions will be some free response. Uh, some will be give me your R code. Some of it will be uh, copy and paste an image that you created, a graph that you created in R into your submission. 
right? And then here's our schedule subject to minor modifications. This week we'll uh, do review of linear algebra and introduce random vectors and probability distributions that apply to them. Then we'll do exploratory data analysis, basic exploratory data analysis, like when you load in a data set, what should you do first? What kind of pictures can you make? What kinds of summary statistics that you can you compute? Um, when you have a data set, step one should always be to look at the data. We don't take a data set that we just have now been introduced to and go straight to a complicated statistical method. Because often the method that you use has some assumptions that your data are you know, well behaved in certain ways. There's not uh, lots of outlying values, for example. Are there any or many missing values? Are there errors in the data itself? It should have said $200 for the price of this object, but somebody made a mistake and put $20,000. We would like to catch things like that as early as possible. So think of yourself like a detective when, when you first get your data. You want to look at it from every angle you can think of. Uh, you're just looking for anything unusual. You would like to see if the patterns that you expect to be there are there. If it's a treatment versus placebo trial, for example, do you see differences between the two groups? Um, other things that you can catch by exploratory analysis are technical artifacts of the way the data were collected. So for example, suppose we're, we have a, a sample of 100 observations. Uh, they are mice, say, and we're going to measure four variables on each mouse. The mice are randomized into a treatment group and a control group. And suppose that because of the nature of the assays that we do, we can only assay five mice a day. The laboratory technician can only get five done in a day. Suppose we looked at the data, made appropriate pictures, and we saw that there were batch to batch differences in the responses that we measured. We would like to see stuff like that. If there's systematic differences between the technicians who prepared the data, systematic differences between day of the week they were prepared, anything like that, that's the kind of thing you go searching for initially, making pictures, computing summary statistics. We will spend a little time talking about multivariate generalizations of a t-test. So a t-test is appropriate when you want to do inference on a mean population mean or a difference in population mean? Is the average pH in this lake equal to 7.2 or not? In the multivariate case, we're going to be asking, is the pH and the salinity and whatever equal to something or not? Multivariate assessment. T-tests uh, generalize, it turns out, pretty easily to the multivariate case. If we assign, if we assume this multivariate normal distribution, then there's basically multivariate t-tests. There is also a multivariate ANOVA. So ANOVA, you know from STAT 101, is a univariate technique for doing inference on a difference in means when there's three or more groups that you want to compare. You just have two groups, like treatment and control, old uh, technique versus new technique, you could do a two-sample t-test. But suppose you have three comparison groups. Fertilizer 1, fertilizer 2, fertilizer 3. Is there any difference between fertilizers in terms of the multivariate response? That's an ANOVA-like question, but it's not univariate. So the univariate ANOVA stuff that you learned in STAT 101 doesn't apply. We have to generalize uh, to a multivariate ANOVA. So if your circumstance is you have multivariate data, p variables, say, that are measured on every individual. And you want to compare those uh, vectors of averages for each of the p components between three or more groups. Think multivariate ANOVA. Uh, then we'll spend some time on prediction slash classification. So discriminant analysis is related to the task of classification, but it actually has its own 
merits uh, just without the classification part. Discriminant analysis refers to uh, trying to separate groups as well as possible. So suppose we have, I'll show you a data set later, we have Major League Baseball players, and for each one of them, we know, are they in the Hall of Fame or not? We have all retired Major League Baseball players. And for each person, we have career totals of hits, home runs, RBIs, stolen bases. We have career batting average. We have several statistics. And suppose we want to distinguish what makes somebody a Hall of Fame person versus not a Hall of Fame person. We may have 15 variables. Can we, in a, an interpretable way, say what differs between Hall of Fame and not Hall of Fame is a, a particular characteristic? Discriminant analysis is trying to say uh, the pattern, the, the nature of difference between two or more groups is such and such. That's pretty vague, but we'll say more about it. Classification is then uh, similar. We're trying to separate groups, um, but the task is specifically to make a prediction of group membership. So suppose we had a data set, Hall of Fame, yes or no, for a bunch of retired Major League Baseball players. And since we know Hall of Fame, yes or no, we would call these data training data because the answer that we're interested in is known for these data. So I could explore patterns between those in Hall of Fame and not Hall of Fame and try to build a, uh, a rule that says, here comes a new player for whom we don't know Hall of Fame status, but here's their 15 variables. With those 15 variables, we compare, we, we look into our model that we built with the training data, and essentially we ask, do these 15 numbers, do they look more like the Hall of Fame profile or the not Hall of Fame profile? And based on which one you're closest to, you predict. I predict Hall of Fame because these 15 variables are most similar to the average 15 for Hall of Fame group. We not only predict, but often, depending on the technique we use, we can say how confident we are in that prediction. So for example, we might have a player for whom we say, I'm 78% confident this person belongs in the Hall of Fame. Principal component analysis and factor analysis are both techniques uh, that we could think of as dimension reduction techniques. Um, Think about when you take a, a digital picture with a, with a high-powered camera that has very high resolution. Take a picture, save it on your hard drive, and it's uh, 100 megabytes in size. It's a big, high-resolution picture. If you opened it in the correct, in, in an appropriate image manipulation software, you could save it to a lower resolution. So I'm going to save my uh, five, 50 megabyte image to a lower resolution, now it's only five megabytes. And if you open them up and look at them side by side, it's qualitatively the same picture. You know, say it's a picture of you, both pictures look like you. Just the, the original one was more refined. That's an illustration of like dimension reduction. Taking a multivariate data set, which is basically what an image is, pixels and pixels and intensities in each pixel, taking that and boiling it down to a lower dimensional representation. When we do that, the, the goal is to go from high dimension to lower dimension in such a way that we lose as little information as possible. So we would like to take the original high resolution image, make it smaller, but not lose the essence of the picture. Principal component analysis and factor analysis both are um, techniques for doing things like that. Take P variables and boil them down to two or three. If you had 15, 20, 100 variables, if you could somehow turn your 100 variables into just two variables, and if those two variables could be shown somehow to 
account for or explain 90% of all the story, then you could look at those two variables. And two variables, you just make a scatter plot. You can look at them. And the patterns you see in that scatter plot uh, represent the, the bulk of the structure of the whole thing to the tune of 90% variance explained. So principal components and factor analysis are both techniques for us to take high dimensional data and boil it down to a, a much simpler representation. Uh, cluster analysis is a little different. It's not, it's not dimension reduction, it's a grouping algorithm. In the Major League Baseball example, we have, say, thousands of Major League Baseball players. And we have, say, 15 variables, hits, home runs, batting average, and all of that. A cluster analysis of data like that would group together the individuals, the players, on the basis of their 15 variables. So find, using an algorithm, ways to group players together such that the groupings are more similar within than they are between. What cluster analysis then gives us is uh, a suggestion of structure in the data. It's another way to kind of explore structure in the data. Specifically, it tells us about which individuals go with which individuals. When you see groupings, these individuals group together, and they seem to be different from those individuals, which also group together. Exploring the uh, variables for those two groups can tell you about the nature of the difference. Cluster analysis is something that could be referred to as unsupervised learning. Discriminant analysis and classification are supervised learning. Supervised in the sense that we have to, we have a predefined uh, truth or class that we want to characterize, Hall of Fame or not. Supervised learning would require that we know the, the groupings. Unsupervised learning, like cluster analysis, we don't say anything about grouping. We're asking what, it, what are the natural groupings just based on the data. Canonical correlation analysis is a fairly specialized technique but it can be pretty handy in um, the right circumstances. <clears throat> what, co what canonical correlation does is, uh, well, first let's say, suppose you just have two variables. You have x, you have y. It might be height and weight for human beings. What's the relationship between x and y? How do they co-vary? As one changes, what does the other one tend to do? Co-relationships or correlation speaks to uh, how one variable tends to change as the other one changes. So if height increases, we would expect weight to increase as well. If height decreases, we would expect weight to decrease as well. We would call that a positive correlation. If you think about a different example, like the age of your car and the price you could get for your car when you sell it. The older the car, the lower the price. That would be a negative correlation. Now suppose, that, that's the univariate case. That's stats 101 case. Two variables, what's the relationship between them? What's the nature of the relationship? Correlation is one way to get at that, linear relationship at least. So now let's suppose, instead of two variables, we have two sets of variables. Um, instead of height and weight, we might have uh, in, the st in a stock market context, we might have five variables that speak to volatility of the market. And we might have five variables that speak to um, price changes you know, for, for index stocks or something. What's the relationship between volatility and price, say? It's like a correlation question, but it's, different. it's a little more complicated because now it's a multivariate question. I have P variables and maybe Q variables. It's not one and one. Canonical correlation is like a multivariate generalization of correlation. 
And what it gives us is, for these p and those q variables, it gives us a number, a single number, that's a correlation, a number between minus 1 and 1. The higher or the closer it is to 1 or minus 1, the stronger the relationship. It also tells us something about the nature of that relationship. So we'll see that more. But canonical correlation is when you want to relate two sets of variables. We'll talk about multivariate linear regression. So this is analogous to multivariate ANOVA. Um, linear regression is a very general way to model things. When you have a continuous response variable, and some collection of predictor variables, which could be categorical or numeric. If you want to model the relationship between the mean response and these predictor variables in a linear way, that's linear regression. It's also, yeah, we'll say that, linear regression. So multivariate um, context, we need to generalize to multivariate regression. So we'll say vector y the response vector y equals a linear function of predictor variables. I'm going to spend some time talking about um, the bootstrap. Bootstrap is a resampling technique that allows us to do inference. It helps us to do statistical inference, uh, particularly useful when classical techniques aren't appropriate, whether it's small sample size, and we don't think our data are normal, or whether we are um, interested in inference on like a non-standard parameter, like the ratio of standard deviations or something. Um, bootstrap is a general technique. It leans on your computer. It's computationally intensive, but it's a very general technique for enabling inference. So I'm going to plug it in here and say, when we talked about multivariate linear regression, when we talked about multivariate ANOVA, when we talked about multivariate t-tests, there, there are going to be these assumptions of normality. And that's kind of less than ideal. Bootstrap is a technique that allows you to get away from a lot of those assumptions. And we'll finish with some basic uh, graphical procedures. You may have heard of things like multidimensional scaling, biplots. Um, there are graphs that you can make for multivariate data. Um, the main challenge of multivariate data is just that it's hard to investigate. Um, you can't look at a big matrix of numbers with your naked eye and see anything. So we really, there's a premium on uh, techniques for summarizing the data in a lower dimension and graphing it in a lower dimension. Okay, are there questions so far? Then let's go, let's see. Let's go to um, some notes. So I downloaded these just now from eCampus. Uh, throughout the semester, you're going to get a variety of things from me. You will get some lecture slides. You will get lots of R scripts. And my R scripts have lots of comments in them. So. I use our scripts basically like lecture notes. Suppose you know, we want to make a scatter plot to investigate the relationship between height and weight. Here's the code, and here's my uh, interpretation of it. So you'll have lecture notes for at least some of the topics. You'll have our scripts for all of the topics. Uh, you have the textbook that you can be reading. I'm going to follow the textbook pretty closely. But these are uh, my first batch of notes. Okay, so let's start here. All right, so multivariate, where does this come from? It's the difference between univariate and not univariate. Univariate is a single number for each individual. You almost never have that, actually. Uh, if you have a, think of your data as an Excel spreadsheet with rows for individuals and columns for variables. Uh, you, 
almost always have for each individual more than one thing that you measure. It might be uh, a response variable, but then you might have gender and race and age and all kinds of other things. Univariate statistics, Stats 101 stuff, is specifically for when you have one variable that you are most interested in, one variable of interest, which might be survival time after a treatment. It might be the proportion of devices that are broken or SAT exam score, univariate. Multivariate would be, again, you're measuring multiple things simultaneously. So for a human patient, you might measure the total blood count, the uh, LDL and HDL uh, counts in a blood test. Three things for each individual. Or for a, a stock, you might measure trading volume, percent change, and maximum price of a stock over a week or something. And the key is, we're going to do our statistics, our analysis and investigation, by keeping those variables together. We're going to treat them simultaneously. These five things pretty well summarize uh, the totality of what we'll see. Everything we're going to do is one of these things. Dimension reduction I talked about. That's the idea of taking high dimensional data and uh, using matrix algebra, boiling it down to a lower dimensional representation in such a way that you preserve as much of the information as possible. Statistical inference, think confidence intervals, hypothesis tests, correlation, uh, canonical correlation, and some other things. Discriminant analysis and cluster, I'm sorry, discriminant analysis is like classification. That's trying to predict the value of a categorical variable. Are you in the Hall of Fame or not? Do you have tumor grade one, two, or three? Is this email spam or not? Making predictions and cluster analysis. Uh, dimension reduction, I've talked about that. It's trying to take P variables and boil them down to some lower dimension, K, K less than P. Can we find K new variables that tell us just about as much information as all the P variables did? The way we're going to do this and the way that a lot of the multivariate statistics stuff works is we're going to look for linear combinations of the original variables. Suppose we have 15 variables. Suppose that if I, suppose I could do like um, a constant times variable one plus a different constant times variable two plus dot, 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 a linear combination of those 15 variables. So I took 15 variables and I turned it into one. Instead of 15 numbers, I turned them by adding them together into one. And suppose I can find another one, another linear combination that's perpendicular to the first one, if I choose those carefully, what we will end up with is 15 variables boiled down to, say, two. Two linear combinations of the original ones. And the way we pick those is such that these two um, explain as much variance from the original data as possible. So principal components and, and this, this type of uh, boiling down to linear combinations, I think it will take some of us multiple hearings before it clicks. It took me many times before it clicked for me. So let this uh, type of language you know, uh, grow on you, I guess. If it didn't click this time, we'll see it plenty throughout the semester. But a lot of what we're going to be doing is taking P variables and considering linear combinations of them. Factor analysis also looks at uh, a particular type of linear combination, but instead of trying to force our P variables into one with a linear combination of them, it takes each of the variables and writes it as a linear combination of unseen or unknown latent variables. Some of this stuff is pretty hard to put intuition behind until we really get to it. Multivariate statistics um, is interesting because it's very useful. This class is filled to the gills. Like, uh, it's capped out um, because everybody 
sees that there's value to principal components, cluster analysis, and that kind of thing. Uh, but what will set you apart, I hope, after you finish this class, is that you'll be one of the few who can actually explain what a principal component plot means. A lot of people know how to make us how to click a button to do principal components, and you get a color-coded scatter plot, and you say, "See, there's a difference." But when your boss or your colleague asks you, well, what does that mean exactly, uh, you will be set apart if you can say, well, those are the eigenvectors and eigenvalues of the covariance matrix. See? Factor analysis, similar. It's hard to explain. Uh, the reason I want you to have the linear algebra background is so that you can understand what it's doing. Here's an example. <clears throat> Um, these are census tract level data. So the U.S. Census <clears throat> has different geographic regions within which it has uh, data. There's states, there's counties, there's census tracts. So we have census tract level data on five socioeconomic variables in a particular city. <clears throat> Here's our variables multivariate because for each of my individuals which is a census tract I have five things that are measured total population percent of population with professional degree percent age 16 or over who are employed percent employed by government and median home value okay so this data set uh, I can't remember how many observations we had let's say we have 50 we would have a 50 by 5 Excel spreadsheet full of data. <clears throat> Individuals are always going to go <clears throat> in our rows, and variables are always going to go in the columns. So we'll talk about an n by p data matrix. That's like the, the currency of multivariate statistics, an n by p data matrix. We take, using what's called principal component analysis, we could take this 50 by 5 matrix and boil it down to a 50 by 2. So this is the result of doing something called principal components. And what we have is, uh, for example, these three numbers. We have taken five variables, and we have turned them into five new variables. We call these new variables principal components, PC1, 2, 3, 4, 5. What we get to say about each of these is the proportion of the total variance, the proportion of the variance that uh, is represented by the five, all five of the variables, the proportion of that total variance that can be explained with just one variable constructed in a particular way, in this case, is almost 70%. So you can almost, uh, you can get quite a bit of the story with a single number for these data, even though they're multivariate with p equal five. And if you add one more, you, uh, you bring that up to 93%. So you can very accurately represent this five-dimensional data set with only two variables. And if we look at these numbers, uh, these, the things that are empty are actually not exactly empty. They're just <coughs> smallish numbers. So they're, um, when you go to R and we do this stuff, you'll see that it does this by default. What it's trying to do is guide your eye to say, let's focus only on the, like the substantive magnitude numbers. Let's look at PC1, the first column, PC1. This is a linear combination of the original variables. So PC1, roughly speaking, because we're ignoring some small numbers, is minus 0.1 times professional, plus roughly 0.5 times employment, minus 0.9 times government. So we could arguably ignore this professional number because it's pretty small in magnitude compared to the other two. If we only looked at these two, what we have is uh, our new variable, PC1, is roughly a difference between employment variable and government variable. So employment was percent who are employed, and then the government variable was percent employed by the government. 
that 0.492 and minus 0.863 is essentially saying take a difference, take a weighted difference between employment and government. And that turns out to explain an awful lot about these data. All you need to do is compare employment to government. So you could distinguish the census tracts, apparently, to a large degree in terms of those that have uh, high employment and low government um, percent jobs, or the other way around, low employment and high government jobs. So if you characterize each census tract in terms of that linear combination, you would spread the data out as much as possible. Among all linear combinations, you would spread it out as much as possible. OK. So I am, I'm definitely previewing. Don't worry if this does not uh, all make perfect sense just yet. But I'm trying to motivate where we're going. Factor analysis is kind of similar, but it's not exactly the same. I'm going to wait to get to that before we talk about it. Inference on mean vectors is like uh, multivariate t-tests, or multivariate ANOVA, or multivariate linear regression. So if, if you have a situation where ANOVA is the natural thing to do, then if your data are multivariate, you have a technique. R has functionality in it to do most of these uh, basic analyses uh, with a single function. So it has built-in functions. Let's see. Canonical correlation. Let me show you an example. Canonical correlation is, like I said, a, a correlation assessment between two sets of variables. Or here we're saying between two random vectors. So a random vector would be a set of variables. It's a generalization of univariate correlation. And what we do is linear combinations again. Specifically, what canonical correlation does, suppose we have five variables of one type and six variables of another type. What's the nature of the relationship between those two sets of variables? If it was just two, num two variables, if it was height and weight, correlation is a natural thing, univariate correlation coefficient. We have five and six, though. But what if we took those five and did a linear combination? Now instead of five, we just have one. And what if we took these six and turned them into a linear combination? Now I just have two variables, and I can compute a correlation between two variables in the usual way. What canonical correlation does is it goes and finds the two linear combinations such that when you do compute that correlation, it's maximized. So a canonical correlation is like the most correlated these two sets of variables are. And then if you investigate the coefficients of the linear combination, it tells you about the nature of that relationship. Here's an example. Uh, we have inter-country life, cy life cycle savings data. I don't know what that means. For each of 50 countries, we have five variables. So we have saving, we have 50 countries, 50 rows in our Excel spreadsheet, and five columns. Savings ratio, percent of the population, uh, I think, I can't remember. Let's say percent of the population 15 years or younger. And then we have percent of the population 75, 75 or older, per capita disposable income, and percent growth rate in disposable income. So what if we said, here's five variables, and I want to compare the population characteristics, those two percent population variables. What's the nature of the relationship between this population characteristics and these financial characteristics? So let's compare savings ratio, per capita disposable income, and percent growth rate, set one, to a different set, percent population less than 50 percent greater than 75. What's the nature of the relationship? Here's output that we would get if we went to R and said do canonical correlation. Uh, <clears throat> and it is going to give us a couple of linear combinations. So for the population variables, we had two variables. 
percent less than 16, percent over 75. This was the linear combination of those two variables that the algorithm found using linear algebra. So if you do minus 0 0.009 times P15 plus 0 0.049 times P75, then here's a separate linear combination for the other variables, the other three. So if you do this linear combination of the population variables, now it's like there's one population variable and then do this linear combination of the others, now it's like there's one other variable. You could compute the correlation coefficient between those two new variables. And it turns out it's 0.825. So what is the nature of the relationship? What's the strength of the relationship between the population variables and the other ones? There is a sense in which you can say they're correlated to the tune of 0.8. What you specifically mean by that is these two linear combinations have a correlation coefficient of 0.8. When we do canonical correlation, when we do principal components, when we do several of these multivariate techniques, we're going to have uh, multiple outcomes. For example, canonical correlation, I guess we're out of time, is going to give us the best correlation, the best pair of linear combinations that gives us that highest correlation of 0.825. And then it's going to give us as many more as we want. The second one will be two more linear combinations uh, that are restricted to be perpendicular to the first pair. And so it's going to explain less. It's going to have less correlation. But often we'll have one or two that we look at, two different uh, kinds of correlation, maybe. All right, uh, let me just see where we are. So I'll finish previewing uh, the course on Wednesday. I want to go through this slide. I want to talk about cluster analysis briefly. And then at slide 36, you, I would recommend go ahead and read 36 on. It's going to be a little bit of mathematical notation as we move forward, because we're quickly going to get to um, some math, some linear algebra. OK, any questions? Homework will be coming soon, okay? Thanks.